On July 31, 2010, at 6 in the morning, an auction on eBay entered its final hours. The bid price stood at $4,321. The object of this auction was a custom-cut jigsaw puzzle crafted by master puzzle cutter John Stokes. He had high hopes for this auction because his most recent eBay entry had sold for more than $10,000. But while that puzzle was ambitious, it was dwarfed by the current puzzle. The subject for this puzzle was Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, licensed from the Prado in Spain. There were four separate boards cut into 4,000 very intricate pieces then knitted together to make up the original three panels of Bosch's artwork. Stokes had cut the work using his three distinct cutting styles. A mistake on any cut could have doomed the project. The opening bid was pegged to $1 with no reserve. The Bosch puzzle was the 100th puzzle in Stokes's 100 puzzle project, a decade-long self-imposed process where he produced for auction 100 puzzles at roughly monthly intervals. The Bosch puzzle was to be the ultimate effort of that project. On the day, with the auction due to end in a couple of hours, Stokes was becoming concerned that all the work would go for naught. By 7.21, with fewer than 16 minutes to go, the price had ratcheted up, but only to $8,475, well short of the hoped-for final price. Then, with 44 seconds to go, the bid rose to $11,211. At 7.36, with only 15 seconds to go, a huge bid came in, doubling the price to $22,322. With only six seconds to spare, the final bid emerged, $25,100. What can make a puzzle so valuable? This is the story of John Stokes, Puzzle Maker. Well, when I was a child, maybe four, five, six years old, I used to love drawing. I did a lot of squirrels and squiggles and I still have some of these images, and what's amazing is how much they resemble some of the cutting I do today in my creative style. My puzzle making roots go way, way back. As a child, I know that I loved jigsaw puzzles. I had a puzzle that I know I put together when I was about four years old that had about 500 pieces, which is pretty precocious for a four-year-old. And there was a wooden jigsaw puzzle maker named Strauss. I think it was J.K. Strauss, who made uh, what they called grid cut puzzles. It was rows and columns, uh, but it was uh, wooden pieces, and I absolutely loved that puzzle. Now, when I think it was about nine or 10, I got a puzzle made by Madmar. Now, Madmar makes jigsaw puzzles out of wood, and the pieces were a little more squiggly. I eventually got into Big Ben puzzles made by Milton Bradley. They had a thousand pieces. They were also in a grid style. I, I, I still remember 36 pieces by 28. If you multiply that out, it comes out to 1,008. I said, well, it's a thousand piece puzzle. It was actually 1,008. Uh, they just had an intrinsic beauty. I began to think of myself in the mind of a, of a puzzle maker. And when I was 13 years old, uh, my, I went up to the attic. My father had a uh, a jigsaw, or it was one of those saws with a C-shaped thing with a thin blade. I cut up a piece of wood into about 40 pieces. And I first drew a picture, I, a, I recall it had a little flying saucer on it. I cut it into 40 pieces, and uh, it's a shame I don't have that puzzle anymore, but uh, I did do that. I was about 15 years old. I found a way of creating patterns on grid paper. Where I'd draw, let's say, a V, and then from that V, I'd have another V, and then from that V, I'd have another V. And it would propagate into very interesting patterns. And uh, many years later, in college, I began to discover computers. This was in the early 70s, and I took an independent study in, under the art department to program these patterns. And then much later, I developed a program on uh, the Macintosh and formed a company called Pixel Pathways and sold a bunch of these programs black and white in the 89, 90 period. And if I look at the, the amount of money I put into this, the amount of money I got, it was like a total disaster. But, um, but, but I had the program written and 
I could create my own patterns. I think, it, or actually it was in 1999, I was going through a major periodic cleaning process where I winnow out possessions. And I had a bunch of puzzles that I decided to get rid of. And I said, well, maybe I can sell them on eBay. And I had, uh, most of them were cardboard puzzles and I have a few uh, wooden jigsaw puzzles. And I was searching and I saw that, oh, there was this guy selling puzzles that he made. And I had one of these sort of, oh my God, ro a road to Damascus event where it says, I wanted, I am a puzzle cutter. I just, it went from like, the idea didn't occur to me to like, I am a puzzle cutter. Uh, I, that's what I want to do. And um, I believe that was in very late September or early October, 1999. Let's see, it was in November, I was at a uh, art show and met a woman, I was talking to her and said, you know, I'm looking for a place to uh, set up a shop. And she says, oh, well, we have a collective of artists and we, we welcome artists. And so uh, I found that it was called Mixed Media. It was here in San Diego. And I went there and said, well, I, I would like some space to set up a shop. And at that point, I had never even seen a scroll saw, which is the tool used to, to cut it. And uh, I found out that's what they use. And they had a very cheap uh, saw. I believe it was a $75 saw. I've forgotten the name of it. Started learning how to cut. Um, I just got a blade and put it in. Didn't realize that you need to change them out after a while. They, they break or... And so with my very, very first puzzle, puzzle number one, which is a piece of plain wood about this by this, which I just spray painted. And then after puzzle number two was uh, I, I started my own style. Uh, I'm 100% self-taught. Middle of September 1999 that I established the shop, came up with the name Custom Puzzle Craft, uh, and registered that on January 8th, 2000. And I had my website up a single page, uh, I believe it was March 15th, 2000. And um, I made a bunch of puzzles uh, between uh, the end of 2000, I'm sorry, 1999, up till April of 2000. I made 17 puzzles of which I have about 10 of them, experimental, very, very experimental. It, it's wonderful to see just how bad I was back then. And also, it's really interesting to see how my styles evolved. You can actually look at these puzzles and see, oh, that's how I developed my swirly curly style. That's how I developed my squiggly style. I started selling puzzles on eBay, one puzzle a month. And it was after about the fourth or fifth puzzle was sold on eBay, I came across some craftsman, I think it was making cufflinks, had something called the 100 Cufflink Project. And I said, that's a cool idea. Well, I'm gonna have a 100 Puzzles Project. So the prices I got for the puzzles were fairly constant up until uh, the late 80s uh, in the series. And then they really started taking off and I had puzzles that were going over, over for $1,000. And I took more and more time to really make, I decided this, this project was going to end in a just phenomenal, historic manner. I really wanted huge, magnificent puzzles towards the end that I just put a lot of time and effort into uh, and really bring in high prices. When I got up to puzzle number 98, I decided I was going to make the most dense swirl curl cut style puzzle of, in, in the series, about 1,300 pieces. This one here was a large puzzle and I took the risk of mounting it myself. And I had, unfortunately, disastrous consequences. Uh, a lot of, I've had some failures over the years in making puzzles, but this is the worst fail ever because I had gotten so far into this puzzle, this whole lower half was totally finished, beautifully cut. Well, what happened was the gluing was not perfect and the paper was loose as I was cutting. So I was trying to hold down the paper so it wouldn't start flapping as I was cutting. And I said, this, this is going to be really, really difficult. The, the, the saw hits the edge of the paper and, and loses or clips out a little bit of the image. I just had some very, very subtle, had about two or three subtle instances of that happening. But when I got over here, I was cutting this spiral here and the paper just completely ripped off. And I lost that little round flap. And you can see that's where I stopped the cutting, right there. 
well, really what I did was I cut in a, too close and it was a very thin little cut there. I could have, if it was glued down properly, I could have come out and, and continued, but instead I lost that. And at that point, I said, well, I could look for that little piece of paper and glue it down. And I said, you know what? For This is the 100 Puzzles Project. I just can't have this happening. And I just said, that's it. And I just walked away from it. And um, But I, I've just kind of kept it. It's, it's a wonderful sort of, sort of, you know, it, it shows what a puzzle is like when it's half cut. I mean, you can see the initial cut here. This is where I came down while I was subdividing the board. Then I picked up here and I just went right down this line and I continued. And uh, so this shows the different shapes that I had was about to cut or planned to cut. I planned to cut this really interesting spiral in here. However, I, I got another print and made the puzzle and sold it on the 100 Puzzles Project as number 98 and it went for several thousand, thousands of dollars. Um, so it was a huge success. But this, this represents about a, a week, at least a full week of work lost. Puzzle number 99 was, I was kind of aiming at Wall Street. I decided I'm gonna make a puzzle in the shape of a dollar sign. And in that puzzle will be the logos of all 500 of the Fortune 500 companies, plus my own logo. <laughs> and I just thought this puzzle should go for maybe $10,000, $20,000. And I'm, uh, I actually would have been disappointed with anything less than 10. And it actually ended up just clearing 10. But um, my understanding is that uh, a person who does the high speed computer trading uh, won it and it's in, in the office somewhere. I have not confirmed this, but... Uh, and then number 100 was uh, the Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. And, I don't know when I discovered that painting, but maybe as a teenager, I just thought it was just one of the greatest paintings ever painted in the history of the world. And I said it would just be magnificent if I could paint that and or make a puzzle out of that. And so I said, well, I really ought to get, first of all, I need a really high resolution image of it. And second, I probably should work about getting intellectual property rights for it. A person I knew in New York who had connections with the art world uh, went through the Prado and got the rights to the image and I got uh, a CD with, with a scan of the images on it and I loaded my computer and just said not good enough. I said what am I going to do? This just isn't good enough. Well then incredibly I found out that Google Earth had gone into the Prado and made some high resolution photos of this image. Then I discovered that the Google painting had shadows and uh, where they lost about a half inch of the image. And, but the image I'd gotten from the Prado on the disc, that had shadows running along the left and right hand sides of the painting. So in Photoshop, I took the little splices from the one and, and filled it in on the other and masked it so you really couldn't tell a difference. So I figured I probably have one of the best digital images of this painting. Uh, and since it was in the public domain, I wasn't concerned about contacting Google about it since I had already gotten permission from the Prado. So once I had that, I, I printed it and made the puzzle from it. The left panel I decided to do in swirl curl, the middle panel, which is the largest one, I decided to do in long round, and the hell panel I decided to do in creative. 2010 is when the project ended. The last puzzle, number 100, was in, auctioned in, in July of 2010. After the 100 Puzzles project was completed, I had about uh, two years worth of commissions to do. And at that point, I had decided that I was gonna close a shop. A couple of these puzzles were purchased by uh, an, a puzzle collector, a local, and I've been in contact with him. And as I was winding down my project, I still had this one puzzle to do. Uh, so I came up with the idea of tricky circles, and of course, I was gonna cut it in creative style, and. Uh, However, this particular puzzle was essentially circular shaped with circular small circles within and kind of extending beyond the edge of the puzzle. So that I designed in Photoshop. 
uh, very specifically. I said the puzzle is going to be 25 or 25 and a half inches in diameter. Uh, designed it, let's say, at 300 dots per inch, so I got good resolution for the circles and basically just designed the outline of the puzzle, all the, all the interior and exterior edges. But as far as the actual cutting itself, I have no idea what I'm gonna do until I'm at the saw. And I'm basically down to my last two boards. It's either this one or the next one. And if I fail both of those, um, I'm in trouble. Okay, took, this is the tension, and I listened to the sound, uh, Oh, this is even bigger than I thought it was. Oh my God. I have to bring this out a little bit. As soon as I cross the, this pink line here, I'm in for the money. This is a, you know, it's a money shot, so to speak. The goal of the initial cut is to get the board in the two halves and then maybe into quarters or thirds because it's very difficult to handle a very large board around a tiny little blade without bending and breaking the blade. And in this puzzle, it was nice because I had some large dropout, so I just have to cut to the first dropout and scream over to the next uh, bridge and then to the next dropout. Well, the cut's going very well. So the actual amount of initial cutting for this puzzle was far less than, uh, let's say, the Hieronymus Bosch puzzle, which was uh, probably one of the most harrowing things I ever did in my life. So if the slightest jar should happen, I would lose the whole work. I have to, I have to be on my game, so to speak, all the time. You can't ever let up while cutting. You have to have constant concentration while, while cutting a puzzle. I once had a, a guitarist come in here and he said, oh, these are such nice riffs. You, you know, each little variation would be like a riff. It's amazing, every now and then I'll do something that, that I don't think I've ever done before. And this one here, I think is an example. So the three of them will have the appearance of having been planned, but of course when I started, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to be doing. So what I have right here is a line. I like the way it flows, so I'm going to put some different feature, but have it end at the same place the line, the imaginary line is. Cutting with paper like this is very unusual. I don't normally do this. Ringo Starr said, act naturally. <laughs> All right, we're done. You always can feel, if, if there's slight variations, you'll feel a little slight wobbliness. This was a really good cut. I curled it this way. Usually I'll curl them all in the same direction, but I decided to make a small one and then curl it in the other direction. This is what I, what I saw it was cool, this little structure here, and I continue this line down my line like that. But it really requires just total focus. Did some pretty straightforward, it's not particularly fancy, but um, has to be good enough so it'll blend in with a more intricate style when I get going to it. All right, so I'm then gonna cut this piece, and then I'll, the paper gets removed completely from this section. Uh, I think the puzzle sold for three or four thousand. What was amazing was I thought the customer would take a really long time to put it together, but he was a good one and he got it done in about 19 hours. There is a group that meets every two years. It's called simply the Puzzle Parley. 
a woman named Paige Elliott came up with the idea that we ought to have a, a form or a method or a venue whereby these scattered puzzle cutters around the country can come up and meet and share ideas. And there's, their agendas are fairly similar from, from uh, party to party. They'll have a session on, it's like a round table session where they get puzzle experts sitting up at one end and then everybody can ask them questions like, well, how do you do this or how do you do that? How do you, how do you deal with copyright issues, for instance? What kind of glue do you use? Uh, what kind of wood do you use? What kind of blades or saws? Uh, do you have any recommendations for this and that? And then usually Ann Williams or someone else will uh, present a fascinating history of you know puzzles in the 1918. There, there was a huge craze of puzzle making in the, I believe about from 19, 16, 17, 18, where there was just a national craze of, of wooden jigsaw puzzles. And then there was a sort of an echo rebound craze in 1931 or 32. For instance, the uh, Parker brothers who made the pastime puzzles, which are still sought out by collectors, those were made, uh, they had 400 puzzle cutters and there were all women who uh, were sewing machine operators because this, it's very pro the, the process is very similar. You have a very tiny vertical action and you're moving something around in the action, around the action. And uh, the first puzzles they made, they were sold for one cent per puzzle piece. So if you had a hundred piece puzzle, you'd, you'd pay a dollar for it. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, uh, routinely puzzles go for at least a hundred times that now, probably a dollar per puzzle piece or two dollars per puzzle piece. Uh, I have an artist that I know named Kei Chin, and I was particularly attracted to his dragons. One day I got an email from someone saying, I have two Kei Chin paintings, uh, we'd be interested in buying them. And I, I said, well, well, what are they of? And he said, well, one of them is a dragon. And it was a heretofore unknown Kei Chin dragon. I think there's seven or eight in the world that I know about. I said, yeah, uh, I'm very interested in this. And uh, the artist lived in Chicago and I, eventually, I went to Chicago and bought the painting and I have it now. The cool thing about this auction is I'm gonna be going to the puzzle parley and the Puzzle Parley has, uh, this August, has uh, an hour which people can buy and sell puzzles. Well, I'm not gonna have a booth there per se, but I am gonna put this, have this puzzle done and completed and auctioned on eBay with the auction time to end in that one hour interval during the uh, puzzle selling period at the, at the Parley. And that's gonna be on August 13th. Got to be a little more careful here. I'm going to go a little faster. All of a sudden, I'll just leap forward, and uh, I can lose the puzzle that way. Okay, well this is just gonna be more of the same, just cutting into smaller sections for about 10 minutes. Okay. And then, then I'll do the figures. All right, well, I'll clear real fast. No breaks or anything.
Uh, no, I'm going to cut this in, in half one more time, then I'll, then I'll do the figaro. Sometimes when cutting within a crowded image, it's very hard to see the blade. It gets hidden in the landscape. I tell you, it's not my day for puzzle blades. I didn't realize I captured a star in the tip of one of them. The final puzzle I did cut, which was the Golden Dragon, was sold at the Puzzle Parley. And that puzzle did really well. It sold uh, at a good price. I was very pleased it won the Best in Show. In August 2016, John Stokes closed the shop at Mixed Media, ending his 15-year journey as a professional puzzle cutter. During that time, his skills grew from simple monochromatic early puzzles through diabolical pictureless puzzles of over 1,000 pieces to his world-class 4,000-piece masterpieces. At some point, he plans to set up his shop on a smaller scale. But in the meantime, his efforts have been focused on the remodel and landscaping of the vintage home he and his wife Katie purchased in San Diego. But even there, you can see his puzzle maker's mind for patterns continuing in full force. And I had one of these, oh my God, ro a road to Damascus event. I am a puzzle cutter. Uh, I, that's what I want to do.